Auspicious greetings to viewers around the world. Welcome to a new episode of Introduction to Buddhism. This is our third and last episode on the six perfections. Before we begin, let's briefly go over what was discussed in the last two episodes. In the first episode, we discussed the basic definition of a bodhisattva, as well as the first perfection, the perfection of generosity. We touch upon how we can practice generosity in our daily lives. As for the second episode, we learned about the perfections of precept, patience, and diligence. Upholding precepts is about not violating other people and sentient beings. Moreover, we learn to respect them and treat them with compassion. Patience is a practice in increasing our inner strength. It is not only about keeping one's cool in face of internal or external adversity, but also to remain kind under challenging circumstances. As for diligence, it is a persistent effort that encourages us to do all that is wholesome. We need to be diligent when practicing all of the six perfections. In other words, we need to practice generosity. Precept, patience, meditative concentration, and pratnya wisdom diligently. For this episode, we will be looking at the last two perfections, which are the perfections of meditative concentration and pratnya wisdom. Meditation and mindfulness. Are two terms that have seen an increase in popularity in the last few decades. Many people are drawn to the practice of meditation and mindfulness as a way to deal with their stress and to reconnect with themselves. The practices of meditation and mindfulness are not specific to any religions or traditions. Buddhists have been meditating for the past twenty six hundred years. So the question is, why do Buddhists practice meditation? What is the purpose of meditative concentration? The goal of Buddhist practice is to attain enlightenment. But before we can achieve this, we need to purify our physical, verbal, and mental karma, and to accumulate merit and wisdom. Meditative concentration is a way to purify our three karmas. As we sit in meditation, our mind is focused on a meditative object. For example, our breathing. This practice guides us back to the present moment, to be mindful, so that we will not be distracted and overwhelmed by what's happening inside ourselves and also outside. This is a state of serene equanimity. But what happens after our mind is calm and serene? When we are in this clear-headed state, we can contemplate upon the teachings of the Dharma and cultivate our wisdom. Gradually, we will be able to discover our intrinsic nature. Meditative concentration helps us to clear the sediments of our minds and allow our wisdom to emerge. If we truly put our hearts into practicing meditation, you will discover the wonderful potentials that you never knew you had. So, how do we practice meditation? It doesn't start with sitting down on a cushion and closing your eyes. In the book Xiao Zhi Guan, or the condensed techniques for stopping delusion and seeing truth, it didn't. Instructed that there are five things we need to balance as a beginner in practicing sitting meditation, and they are to have balanced meals, balanced rest, a balanced body, balanced breathing, and a balanced mind. What does it mean by balanced meal? It means to have regular meals every day, and not to overindulge or starve oneself. It is harder for us to focus on our meditation if we sit with a full or an empty stomach. 
Moreover, eat food that is beneficial to our body so that we have a healthy body to practice meditation. Secondly, to have balanced rest. Cultivation is not measured by the length of time a person does not fall asleep. If we cultivate in a sleep-deprived state, then we would be spending most of our cultivation time trying to stay awake. Similarly, if we put ourselves in continuous sleep, then can we even call ourselves practitioners? If we wish to meditate well, then we should rest accordingly so that we can remain alert for our cultivation. Next, we need to balance our body. The first thing you learn about sitting meditation is correct sitting posture. We should sit with our legs crossed in either half lotus or full lotus position. Our backs should be upright, our hands in the meditation gesture, our eyes closed, chins tucked, and our tongue resting on the upper palate. Correct sitting posture helps us to be more focused when meditating. Breathing is a very important aspect in Buddhism. Usually, we are not aware of how we breathe, so we find ourselves breathing shallowly, or loudly, or even uncomfortably. The practice of sitting meditation helps us to be aware of our breathing. And we will find that after practicing meditation, our breath is more balanced, more deep, and more steady. Last but not least is to have a balanced mind. Our minds are like a wild monkey that jumps up and down without even a moment of peace. Meditation reigns our monkey mind and leads us to focus on the present moment. It guides us to have a balanced mind. These are the five things we need to balance when we start the journey of practicing meditative concentration. But is the perfection of meditative concentration only about sitting meditation? Actually, no. Sitting meditation is only one part of it. The more important side is how can we maintain that sense of calmness that we achieve in our meditation in our daily life. To put it in everyday scenario, how can we practice meditative concentration when we are driving a car, buying groceries, working in office or working at home, taking care of children, cooking, you name it. If we can maintain that same sense of calmness when we are arguing with co-workers, stuck in traffic jam, juggling three jobs at once, then we are true bodhisattva practitioners because we are not affected by what's happening around us. One day, the famous Song Dynasty poet Su Dongbo felt enlightened after a meditation session. He immediately seized a brush and paper and wrote a poem. I bow to the heaven above all heavens, whose aura shines on the great universe. Sitting upright on the purple golden lotus, unmoved by the eight winds, I am. Feeling very pleased with himself, Su Dongbo called for his servant and said, Bring this poem across the river to Chan Master Fo Ying. I want to hear what he has to say. The servant took the poem and ferried across the river to the temple where Chan Master Fo Ying lived and came back quicker than expected. So Su Dongbo started to interrogate his servant. So, did the Chan Master say anything? No, sir. What? Nothing at all? Well, the Chan master wrote something on the paper. Give it to me immediately. Su Dongbo seized the paper immediately and searched all over it for the Chan's master's comment. 
Finally, he spotted one word at the bottom of the page, and it says, "fart." Su Dongbo was so angry that he ran down to the docks and ferried across the river. But just as he reached the other shore, and just as he get down from the boat, he saw Chan Master Fo Ying standing at the dock and laughing heartily. Hey, great poet," said the Chan Master. "Didn't you say you are unmoved by the eight winds? How can a simple fart blow you across the river?" The eight winds refers to praise, ridicule, defamation, honor, gain, loss, sorrow, and joy. These are the eight experiences in life that stirs up our emotions. And ignited our actions. However, if we truly practice meditative concentration, then we would not be affected by any of these experiences. As we can see from Su Dongbo, even though he thought he attained a level of calmness in his meditation, but when Chan Master Fo Yin sent him that comment, he was enraged. He has thrown the calmness he attained during his meditation out of the window. However, if we truly practice meditative concentration, we would remain calm and at ease in all situation, and maybe even a little humorous in face of the challenges that life inevitably brings. Once upon a time. Five blind men were ordered by the emperor to enter the royal palace. The emperor said, "There is an animal called the elephant right in front of each of you. Feel it, and tell me what the elephant looks like." The first blind man said, "The elephant is a wall." The second said, "What? The elephant?" Is a pillar. The third said, "No, the elephant is a fan." And the fourth blind man said, "You are all crazy. The elephant is a spear." And the fifth said, "Listen to me. The elephant is a rope." So what does an elephant look like? Does it look like a wall or a pillar? Does an elephant flap away like a fan or sharp as a spear? An elephant is a combination of all these descriptions, but the five blind men, hindered by their lack of sight, are unable to perceive the entirety of the elephant. Furthermore, they refuse to accept the observations of other men and insisted on their own opinions. As stated in Buddhist sutras, the first five perfections are like the blind. In which the sixth perfection is the guide. Each of the six perfections, no matter if it is the practice of generosity, precept, patience, diligence, meditative concentration, or prajna wisdom, is extremely important to a bodhisattva. But prajna wisdom is the most important of them all. Everyone can practice the first five perfections. These cultivations are not limited to Buddhist. However, if we practice the six perfections with a prajna wisdom, then we will find ourselves like the five blind men, hindered by our limitations and unable to transcend to a higher level of cultivation. First, what is prajna wisdom? Is it different from just wisdom? In the book Buddha Dharma Pure and Simple, Venerable Master Xingyun describes wisdom in four levels. The first level is right view. Right view is prajna wisdom as understood by sentient beings. To have right view means to have correct understanding of the law of karma, or the law of cause and effect. If we have right view, we will not be easily affected by external afflictions. And naturally, we will not 
create negative actions that are usually a reaction against external experiences. The next level of wisdom is understanding dependent origination. This is the wisdom as understood by Shravakas and Pratika Buddhas. Every phenomena is dependent in origination. They come into existence when the right causes and conditions combine and cease to be when causes and conditions disperse. For example, a seed can sprout leaves and grow into a tree if the conditions of sunlight, water, and air are present. But if the tree could no longer reach sunlight, water, or oxygen, it would die. This is the second level of wisdom, which is realizing the teaching of dependent origination. The third level of wisdom is emptiness, which is wisdom as attained by bodhisattvas. When we realize that everything in this world is dependent in origination, we understand that the essence of all phenomena is empty. Emptiness does not mean nothing. As the saying goes, wondrous existence arises from true emptiness. Only with emptiness is existence possible. Everything in the universe and in this world can come into being because of emptiness. The highest level of wisdom is Pragna wisdom, which is only attained by Buddhas. As Venerable Master Shimin said, Pragna is the complete and clear wisdom of awakening that all Buddhas attain through realizing the true form of all phenomena. Pragna is pure wisdom without discrimination, to be without deluded emotions or thoughts. Pragna is true and formless wisdom, the direct realization of intrinsic empty nature and that there is nothing to be attained. Do you still recall the story of the blind man and elephant at the start? What is the connection between this story and Pratnya wisdom? The five blind men are like the first five perfections. Without the light of Pratnya wisdom, the five perfections are only mundane practices. So, as we practice the first five perfections, we need to be guided by Pratnya wisdom to perfect our cultivation. Let's look at how we can practice the first five perfections with Pranya Wisdom. How do we apply Pranya Wisdom in our practice of generosity? For an act of giving to be complete, it needs three aspects, the giver, the receiver, and the given object. If any of these components are lacking, the act of giving cannot be completed. Once there was a lady named Mrs. Jones, and she helped to pay her sister's medical bills. Her sister has been battling cancer and was finally declared cancer-free after a year of treatment. Even though Mrs. Jones was very happy that her sister pulled through, but sometimes she regretted helping her sister out financially. First, it was a big amount of money, and second, her sister has no way of repaying that money to her as she doesn't have the strength to find a job. So now, whenever Mrs. Jones saw her sister, she would casually say, Hey sister, I'm the person who loved you the most in this world. Remember, I saved your life. What do you think about this? Though Mrs. Jones decided to help her sister, out of her own will, she regretted her decision soon after and tried to manage her emotion by guilting her sister. As a Bodhisattva practitioner, once we have given something, there is no taking it back. We need to let go of the three aspects of giving. There is no giver, no receiver, and no object of giving. And letting go is only possible when we practice generosity with prana wisdom. If we can give without being attached to the giver, the receiver, and the given object, then we would be a joyfully generous bodhisattva. 
In Buddhism, precepts are a code of conduct for a practitioner. Precepts guide us to be a more wholesome and compassionate practitioner. However, sometimes we may judge other people based on the precept we uphold. For example, we tell our non-vegetarian friends that they are creating evil karma in eating meat. Or if we see a fellow practitioner accidentally squishing an ant, we give them a hard time for it. Precepts is a ruler that we use to measure ourselves, not other people. Precepts help us to refine our physical, verbal, and mental karma so that we are a kinder and more compassionate person. Therefore, we should uphold the precepts without attaching to its form. When we uphold precepts with prana wisdom, we can benefit sentient beings. Patience is a test of one's level of endurance. But mundane patience is sometimes like a pressure cooker. You can keep it in and hold your tongue for one hour, two hours, one day, a week, or even a whole year. But one day, when you cannot contain your anger or stress any longer, you may be like a pressure cooker that was used the wrong way and explode. This is why we need to practice patience with prana wisdom, so that we will not be attached to the notion of self. Moreover, having patience with prana wisdom leads one to realize the patience of non-arising dharmas. You become a practitioner who is patient without the idea of I am being patient. What about prana wisdom and diligence? Have you ever encountered a person who said, How many times do you chant the Buddha's name in a day? What? Only 500? I chant 10,000 times a day. Or, How many hours do you meditate in a day? Only one hour? I meditate for 10 hours a day. Diligence is a virtue which we should hold ourselves accountable. Diligence is our conscious that tells us to never give up and continue to strive for the better. However, sometimes we might get too proud of ourselves after we work really hard and think that everyone else is not as good as us. When we practice diligence with prana wisdom, we will not give rise to arrogance. Moreover, we will be empowered to progress tirelessly. Last but not least, how can we practice prana wisdom with meditative concentration? As we meditate, we might reach a deep state of concentration known as samadhi. Sometimes, being in a samadhi makes us feel very peaceful and at ease, and some people might be attached to these states. If we are attached to samadhi, then we will be stuck in the same state we cannot progress further along the path of cultivation. This is why we need to practice meditation with prana wisdom, so that we will not attach to samadhi. Moreover, practicing meditative concentration with prana wisdom leads one to realize and attain Buddhahood. Prajna is the guide which the other five perfections follow. Without it, the other five perfections are blind. In other words, the five perfections are worldly dharma practices, and only by incorporating prajna wisdom do they become transcendental dharma practices. As Venerable Master Xingyun said about the six perfections, not only does one overcome greed when practicing generosity, but it also benefits others. Not only will one prevent harming oneself when upholding precept, but others as well. No, not only does one overcome hatred when practicing patience, but it will also not harm others out of hatred. Not only does one overcome indolence when being diligent, but it also teaches others not to be indolent. 
Not only does one overcome a scattered and distracted mind when practicing meditative concentration, but it also teaches others not to be distracted and unfocused. Not only does one overcome ignorance and deviant views with prana wisdom, but it also teaches others to overcome ignorant and deviant views. The six perfections are a positive practice of all bodhisattvas. It is very profound, for it helps one to establish wholesome dharma in life, to preserve a continuous enthusiasm for learning, and to finally reach the ultimate show of perfection. That's all for this episode. Thank you for listening. Next week, we will begin a new mini-series called Introduction to Meditation. If you want to learn more about practicing meditation, stay tuned to our future episodes. May you find peace and joy in the Dharma. Omitofo.